And, well, Professor Afton, uh, let us begin with the issue of modernity. It seems from the viewpoint of the West that Islam has a real problem coming to terms with modernity. Is this a problem in Islam, or is it simply the result of the, the accidents of history? Yes, uh, I think it's uh, very good to start with this question because uh, the problem is not of the West and Islam. The problem first is the, what I would call, I apologize for the listeners, the philosophy of knowledge, philosophy of mind, human mind. Are we raised with culture, which is a changeable and a changing evolution, or are we fashioned from the beginning from what religious people call, for example, revelation by God. This is the first issue. And this issue and this question, you, we can apply to all people in the West, in China, in a, anywhere, for ancient societies, for contemporary societies, and we have to make it very clear from the beginning so that the listeners, whether they are Muslims or Europeans, do not keep thinking that there is something essential to Europeans and something different and also essential to Muslims only. This is absolutely a wrong way of thinking. So we have to make it very clear what we have to say about Islam, we can say it about Christianity, about Judaism, about Buddhism, about Marxism, about liberalism, about all systems of thinking, which are the historical product of human beings living in societies. We have, for example, we shall certainly talk about the Quran. The Quran is received by Muslims as a revelation, as the word of God himself. But this word of God is expressed as the Mu'tazilit, uh, a theological school in uh, classical Islam put it. It is written in an Arabic language. It is put in a book, and this Arabic language is a natural language. It is a human language linked to people living in society. So we have to read it as we read any other discourse or text in any other language. I mean, we have to apply all the rules of linguistics to come to the interpretation of this text. So this has to be very clear from the beginning. And Islam is submitted to all the changing process happening in so many societies where Islam uh, is spread since uh, many years. So if we understand this, I hope the rest will be clear. But in fact, there is a, um, a strong feeling amongst orthodox or scripturalist Muslims that what you have just said, that the, the Quran, that Islam is, in a sense, a, 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 a product of, of human society and history, that the, the Orthodox would say, no, there came yes. a revelation from God. Yes. This revelation was not specially written for the Arabs. It is eternal. Absolutely. As eternal as God himself. Yes. How can there ever be a meeting of minds between these two attitudes? Uh, through exchange and culture. Because this attitude itself comes from a style of culture, a kind of culture. It is not, again, a substantial, unchangeable attitude. It's one type of attitude which happened to be uh, expressed in the history of Islamic thought itself. For example, those people, as you mentioned them, do not know what the Mu'tazid have said about this precise question. They have already developed in 8th, 9th, 10th century of Christ. The position which is more open, more mobile than the one developed today by, by those people whom we label as orthodox, as literalist, etc. And also, this attitude is no, it's not specific to Muslims. Jews have exactly the same cleavage 
between literalist orthodox and uh, liberal, uh, open to uh, interpretation, etc. Christians have exactly the same, etc. So here we raise these two trends of culture which uh, design a psychological configuration of our mind. Once we get it through our ed education, through the language in which we have been educated, it will work in us psychologically as a configuration, as a very strong system, which is very difficult to change even through culture because you are going to bring another configuration to substitute it to this working configuration which we got from our language from the beginning and from our style of education. And the style of education in all Muslim countries since the last 50, 50s and 60s ha has been shaped not only by this so-called uh, religious configuration, but by something stronger, which is the political ideology of the state nation which emerged in the 50s, in the 60s, which applied to the whole society the same educa uh, ed educative system. So here we bring another force which will add to the religious configuration of knowledge a political configuration of that knowledge which will be used for another purpose which is political than the educational purpose, the religious purpose, the cultural purpose. This is also extremely important to understand why Muslims are behaving like they do not only in their societies but even as the minorities when they come to European societies and Europeans are opening, the, opening their, their, their eyes and wondering what's happened, what is happening with these, with these Muslims speaking like this, behaving like this. But Europeans when they look to Muslims like this forget themselves history. They forget that this look which they are putting on Muslims is also the result of a special education since 18th century in Europe, since the reason of enlightenment, since the historical knowledge with, with its special procedures, special uh, approach or of all what is happening in these issues, religious, etc., has been the only one way adopted by Europeans and they don't remind themselves that it is the result of history and this history has changed the previous attitude of Christians in European societies which was just the same as the one we discover today with Muslims. So you see how both are uh, 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 rejecting or forgetting that they are the result of historical process. We should stick always to this. Let's add uh, what, what, what slide are you on? Uh, one. Yeah, can, you go into, yeah, yeah. Yeah. can you go into, uh, yes, closer and prepare to zoom in if I tap you on the. Um, I think that's strong, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. I think you have, from, from your own life, personal experience of the, the creation of the nation state. Could you, could you tell us something about how it was for you and your family? Absolutely, yes. I am, uh, as you know, uh, from Algeria, and I have been a student, young student, during, during the war of liberation uh, in Algiers, as well as here in Paris. I was uh, traveling uh, between the two countries, and I remember very well uh, the atmosphere of the time of the war for liberation. It was the time of euphoria, euphoria of all Algerians fighting, struggling for their political liberation. And we didn't yet have all this very strong ideology which is linked to Islam as the liberating force. Our language was more linked to the reason of enlightenment as we got it from French culture. The elite as well as the uh, 
uh, as the militants, the ordinary militants, were more acquainted with this view of freedom, of democracy, of all the uh, enlightenment values, as we call it here in Europe, than by this Islamic integ in integrist, I don't know if you say in English, fundamentalist use of religion, which will happen much more afterwards, since the 70s and more in the last 80s. It's a very recent phenomenon. You see, here, are, here is a product of history. Here is a product of a special evolution of the society, because new forces came to work in Algeria after the independence, when we got what we call the state-nation party. One state, one nation, one party, not many political parties. So it is here also a, a very strong ideological system, which is based on the state. The state is responsible to unify the nation, which was not unified, as the ideology says, before, because colonialism has, uh, has uh, uh, broken all the cultural roots of the society, all the personality, Islamic, Arabic personality of the society. This is the presentation of the ideology. So now the state comes, which is a national state with national elites. This state will have the responsibility to rebuild the personality of the society. Just the same thing happened with Pakistan, which has been created from scratch, as you know, just with the same view. And in other countries too, Tunisia, Morocco, all colonized countries, because we have to remind ourselves that, uh, unfortunately, all Muslim countries have been colonized and became independent only after the Second World War. So all had to go through the experience of the state, nation, party, one party, one party controlling the state, and one party responsible to produce the unification of the, of the nation. And when we look to the history of this society, which is called and presented as a unified nation already, we discover that history tells us totally different things from what the official ideology, the ideology for liberation, told us during the liberation and will keep telling us after the, stay, uh, uh, the state, the apparatus of state, takes place as a political force, as a controlling force on the society. This will generate all the troubles, all the contradictions, all the deviations which we are witnessing today in all Muslim societies. And this has to be described very carefully that we do not confuse, as we do all the time, what we call Islam and what has to be called and presented and studied as the evolution of the society, historical evolution, with new forces coming from inside each society, but also forces coming from outside, because Europe didn't stop at all to influence these societies, although politically they have uh, given up uh, for their sovereignty, but they keep until today controlling all these societies. This also has to be very uh, correctly understood because when we speak of Islam also, Europeans here forgot, forget very easily this. For example, French here, they stopped to speak about the Algerian war, what has happened 100, 130 years through the French sovereignty in Algeria, totally forgotten. When somebody tries to remind people here about this, there is immediately a passionate dis discussion. So you see, all this has a very big input on uh, these issues. And another, 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 another personal anecdote that I remember you talking about was what the impact on your home village was of the, the institution for the first time of a ministry of religion. Do you remember that uh, yes. subject? Yes, because I am from a part of Algeria which is called Kabylie. 
And this part of Algeria is uh, related to the Berber culture, Berber society. And by the way, I have uh, to mention here that Berbers are the natives of all North Africa, from Libya to the Atlantic Ocean. The, before uh, the Arabs came, and before Arabic language and Islam uh, has spread in the country, we were all Berbers. And uh, even we had uh, uh, the uh, church, the African church, represented, by, for example, by St. Augustine, who, who, who were a Berber in my country, in Algeria, living in Bonn, Ipon, uh, in the time. So this is uh, also a part of history which is not uh, well known about North Africa. So I belong to this village where we have been totally autonomous from any govern governmental intervention, whether Romans, when the Romans were there, whether uh, Arabs, whether Turks, because Turks also came, whether French even. Nobody came. There was no state control, no police, no court for justice, nothing. The villages run themselves with a total autonomy until 1962, which is the independence of Algeria. Then the nation state came and immediately put the police, put the courts, put the educational system, which is official, put everything related, the fiscal control, the, the tax control, everything which is the expression of the centralized Jacobin state on the model of Jacobin French state. So this is one of my greatest experience because until today, in my work as a historian of Islamic thought, I remind myself, and I know and, and I try to remind, that there is a big difference between societies without scripture, without uh, writing, you say, écriture, and societies based on writing. You have an anthropologist, English anthropologist, Jacques Coudy, who has uh, studied this uh, question from an anthropological point of view, the difference between societies oral, with oral culture, oral languages, and societies based on writing. This is extremely important. It's also a franchise, a franchise for what I call the configuration of our mind and the way we are educated and the way we look to ourselves, to knowledge, to societies, to history, everything. And when the Quran emerged for the first time in Mecca and Medina, it was a oral culture, a oral society. Writing was used, known, but very few, very seldom. The paper didn't exist yet. Even the Arabic alphabet was not yet as it is now, as we know it now, for example. And this is totally forgotten. When we speak about Islam, we refer immediately to all these books which we, ha we have in our mind with uh, uh, clear writing, with clear letters, everything, and we read it and we fight against that. And we forget totally. How was the cultural situation? How was the system of raising a child in an oral culture and an oral society in the time the Quran emerged? This changes totally. The approach of the Quran, if we do it as historians, respecting all the situation of an oral society and what will happen slowly when the Islamic empire with the caliphate state will be in charge of this Quran and will move the whole issue from the oral state to the, the, the oral phase to the writing official phase of culture. This also has to be respected to understand the differences which we witness today. Okay, come on, boy, please. Well, <clears throat> you, you have led very elegantly then to the, to the, the question that I, I'd like to pick up next, which is about the philosophical world of Arabia at the time when the Prophet was born. Yes. 
What kind of a world was it? How did they see themselves? How did the, these Arabs uh, see their place in the universe? Yes. Uh, first, I, I would not use the word philosophical because I said I am historian, so I, I continue to be a historian. Because philosophy will intervene in Islamic thought afterwards. It will intervene mainly in the first cities founded by Muslims after the rise of the Umayyad uh, dynasty and more in the time of the Abbasid dynasty. I hope that these words are, have been mentioned and, uh, and known. In the time just before the emergence of the Quran, we have an Arabian society which is mainly a Bedouin society, people living in the desert, and living in the desert leads to a very special civilization. We call it the civilization of the desert. There are books written with this title, which have to be studied as such in the uh, anthropological approach, with the anthropological, uh, anthropological approach, because anthropology uses, as you know, the method of studying people who are speaking only oral languages, not written languages. History will not come. Historiography will not come. So all this has to be known in this, except, of course, in the cities, especially Mecca, which was already a city of merchants who were trading to the north, from Yemen to the north, to the Syria, and also to the, uh, to the Gulf. And through this trading, Mecca became a center of culture which was linked to the Middle East, what we can call Middle East culture, which was a very rich mixture of many ancient culture, going back to the time of Babylon, going back to the time of Persepolis in Iran, going back to the time of the Assyriac civilization, going back to the Aramean culture, which will be the culture of Jesus in Nazareth, in Palestine. So all uh, the G Greek culture from the time of Alexander, all this is a mixture of many trends of cultures. And these trends of cultures found their way through oral uh, narratives, oral literature, found their way to Mecca, to some educated people. Why I say this? Because it's in the Quran itself. We have a testimony, many testimonies, in the Quran of a foreign vocabulary, foreign to Arabic, and also for, of all these stories, mythological stories, which were the components of this very, very rich, complex uh, Middle East culture, I would say. I didn't mention the Bible, of course. It's there. It's there. It's all there. And in the Quran we find a very large part of the, of the Bible. But we find also the history of Gilgamesh, legend of Gilgamesh, in the Quran, of course. Yes, we find the, 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 the novel, we call it Le Roman d'Alexandre, the, the, the novel of Alexander the Great. It's in the Quran. So you see how these trends have been so strong and so uh, vivid in the uh, popular imaginaire that it worked out the new discourse which emerged in a rich mixture i think totally so i would like to add to your yeah. question that uh, yeah. about the, uh, the the vision the mm. welschauung mm. of the mm. arabs mm. in the time mm. that we can uh, know it through poetry yes. because it is documented through poetry because poetry precise, precisely is the main expression in an oral culture and of course it is linked to the experience, the ecological experience of man in the desert. It expresses, for example, the, uh, uh, what, what has been presented as the force of the destiny, dar, like it is said in Arabic. And also it is uh, uh, a kind of submission to the, fo the cosmic forces, which, of course, a Bedouin cannot control. 
in the desert where these forces are so strong. And this is presented in this uh, uh, poetry. And uh, also uh, in the, for, for religious representations, uh, of course, the Arabic uh, religion was, as we call it, pagan, many divinities. And Mecca here is a religious center from already a long time. And this religious center is, in the same time, a political center linked to the religious worship of many divinities in, the, in, in Mecca. But in the Quran, we find the struggle between the Meccan culture, the Meccan structure of the society, and the Bedouin structure of the society. Because Bedouins didn't accept, for example, to go fighting with the Prophet for the new community. And they are very hardly attacked in the Quran that there are people resisting to receive the word of God and to go for struggle. And this shows the cleavage between two kinds of cultures which were already separated in Arabia as a society linked to uh, a city civilization, uh, sedentaire, as we call it, and nomadic Bedouin civilization. And this will remain, of course, even after the, uh, the, the rise of the, of the new Islamic State. It will remain. And it's even today we have these kind of differences between nomadic culture and uh, peasant culture on one side and uh, urban culture on the other side. Nonetheless, within the lifetime of the Prophet himself, most of Arabia became part of his new theocracy, his new um, religious state. How, how was that achieved? Was it just conquest, or was there something in Islam that captured the imagination even of the You mean nomads? inside Arabia yes. itself or outside Arabia? Well, first of all, inside Arabia. Yes, it was not easy, of course. It went very, very slowly. Uh, as soon as the Prophet died, for example, there has been uh, uh, a rebellion against the new uh, small administration put in Medina. And uh, the first caliph had to fight against this rebellion uh, of people, Bedouins, who wanted to reject this new system of controlling the society and this new hierarchy put, brought by the new, uh, the new religion. So uh, this will continue. And there has been a lot of struggles, of wars, about, uh, uh, among the, uh, the, the, the first Muslims. And there is this very big uh, quarrel, which is, the, which is called in Arabic the Fitna al-Kubra, the biggest quarrel among the first community, which took place uh, in the time of Ali, uh, the cousin of the Prophet Ali ibn Abi Talib. And this uh, uh, was uh, the starting point of the discussions, the theological discussions among Muslims how to approach the Qur'an, how to interpret it, how to link it to the political order in the city, and also wars among Muslims with bloodshed, many bloodshed, precisely about the way to relate to the Qur'an, the new conception, the new Weltanschauung brought by the Qur'an, and the archaic, the traditional Weltanschauung, which was still the Weltanschauung of many, of many tribes, not only in Arabia itself, but also in Syria, in Iraq, in Iran, etc. And then will come all the new ethno-cultural forces from Iran, from Iraq, uh, from Syria, in North Africa, in all the countries where Islam will spread. You will find, of course, other groups ethnic groups, other languages, other cultures. And this is the history of how Islam will shape, will influence these different cultures, these different ethnies, and how these cultures will react and use Islam on their own way and shape it also and give it trends different according to the requirements 
of each culture, for example, in, in Africa, South Sahara, or in North Africa, or in Spain, or in India, or then we come to another approach of what we call Islam. The approach of each society as a very specific society with its specific culture, specific history, and to describe how it has been interrelated to the principles, the general principles brought by Islam, and how far these principles will influence or will be just juxtaposed to beliefs, to behaviors, to uh, political systems, etc., which will keep working in each society. This is, I think, the right approach of the issue, and not when we say that Islam is everywhere and it uh, uh, commands everything uh, from Indonesia to, to, I don't know, this is, this is an apologetic approach and it is also a mythological presentation of what is called Islam. And this mythological presentation, as I said, is strengthened today by the need of unifying the nation, and we come back to the ideology which I, I mentioned, which makes, makes things all more complicated. In the, these first conquests, they were, they were very different kinds of conquests. Um, in the case of Christian lands, um, there was always somewhere else for Christianity to continue to live. In many of those lands also, there was no great culture. But Iran had a very special experience with Islam, did it not? Yes. First of all, a very ancient, proud civilization. Absolutely. And nowhere for a Zoroastrian to go. The whole Zoroastrian domain was, or virtually the whole, was completely conquered. Yes. So how could that Iranian Zoroastrian spirit express itself in Islam? How, what was their way of, of maintaining their own identity? Oh, they did it very well. Very well and very successfully. That's why the case of Iran uh, raises the problem of, for a historian, how to present this civilization. Uh, are we uh, entitled, is it right, to call it Arabic civilization? Or should we say Islamic civilization? Or should we make differences, precisely, giving to each one its own part, historical part? I would say this. There is first the problem of language. Arabic language, since the beginning of the Islamic State in Medina, and then Damascus, and then Baghdad, then from, let's say, 632, the death of the Prophet, until, I would say, 12th, uh, no, uh, rather 11th century, 11th century, Arabic language has had the intellectual, scientific hegemony in the whole area from Iran up to Spain. All people living in that area, whether they are Berbers, Iranians, Syrians, the Palestinians, Egyptians, etc., Turks, etc., all had to express themselves, Jews, don't forget, Christians, had to express themselves in an Arabic language. In that, uh, in that case, from that point of view, it is right to speak on Arabic civilization. As far as all is expressed in Arabic, all the books, in theology, in philosophy, in medicine, in all the books, have been written in Arabic language. So this is after 11th century, Iranians started again to use their own Iranian Persian language. Avicenna, for example, started to write in Iranian language and other intellectuals. The, uh, the Shahnami of Firdausi has been written, as you know, and it was the, uh, the start, the new start of Persian language, and they returned to their very ancient, anciently rooted culture, etc. So the Iranian felt, and also during all the time 
of the, which we call the classical type, when Arabic language had the hegemony, still Iranian intellectuals played a big role precisely to enrich this culture expressed into Arabic with their own cultural legacy, religious legacy, political legacy, which was not dead. It lived through them in the literature produced by Iranian intellectuals in the time of the classical Islam or the classical Arabic civilization. This is what I described myself as the Arab humanist. I called it humanist. I used the concept of humanism, which is a very controversial concept because my colleagues, in the time I wrote uh, my thesis in the 70s, didn't agree. This is an academic issue, but very interesting and very related to our discussion here because they don't accept to apply the concept of humanism to the Arabic culture. Why? Because they told this culture is centered on God. It is not free from theological view uh, of the world, as European humanism after 16th century became totally free and was uh, looking to Roman and Greek culture, which was pagan and made himself free from the reference to Christianity. And you know all the debate which has been re generated by this in Europe. Okay, I say, this is true historically. But when we read intellectuals in 10th century in Baghdad and in the Iranian cities, Shiraz, Rain, which is the present Tehran, uh, Isfahan, etc., what do we discover? We discover an interest for Greek philosophy which made reason free from the almost free, I would say, from the impact of theology. And a real effort to build a humanistic approach to men, to the condition of men in the society, in uh, uh, history, etc., started to be uh, a very, very big issue. This is ignored, not well known because it's also forgotten even by Muslims themselves, those you mentioned as fundamentalists, as literalists, etc. They don't read this literature. They don't, they don't have an idea about what humanism is. So you see that there are many points here to make clear and to rewrite, actually, the intellectual history of thought not in the West from one side as we do it, for Muslims from the other side as we do it. No, this is not right. There is an area, a cultural historical area, stretching from Iran, which you mentioned, up to Spain, south of France, south Italy, all the Mediterranean area, which was submitted to the same world view dominated by the phenomenon of revelation, the phenomenon of prophecy, prophethood, and the phenomenon of Greek culture and Greek philosophy, which gives, as you know, a special uh, posture of our mind. This existed deeply and continuously in all the area dominated by Arabic language and Islamic culture, up to the 11th century and even 12th century. And Europe will enter in this area, will get all the views from Muslim thinkers, Arabic literature, etc., and starts, starts its own evolution since 13th century. As we know, this is the general view. This is the correct historical approach of the history of thought, which would emancipate our mind today from all the prejudices which says Muslims are like this, we, we are like this. No. What has happened is that after 19th century, 
the phenomenon of colonialism and what has happened after has deepened some historical, political, cultural differences between what we call the secularized Europe and the underdeveloped countries. Look to this language, how we write history and how we present it. This is, has to be totally revised and this is the responsibility of uh, historians. <coughs> Going back for a moment to Iran, in later times, Iran chose this Shi'i branch of, of Islam. Is, can you give some of the reasons behind that? Why Iran and Shi'ism particularly? Before that, Shi'ism had been a tiny, small minority uh, sect on the margins. Why, why should Iran take that? take that up so powerfully? Yes, this is a, a, big, uh, a big question, uh, not yet clarified by historians. Because it's not only an Iranian phenomenon. It is a phenomenon linked to all these cultures expanded in Middle East. For example, the messianic movements linked to the history of the prophethood since the biblical time, messianism through Christianity. This messianism has influenced the shaping of the imami conception of charisma incarnated in one man and the possibility for that man to run the society on the basis of an infallible knowledge, as the Messi has to do. So you see, it's a very strong, big, deep trend in the Middle East, not specially linked to Iran. Of course, we have also to look to the religious history in Iran itself. As you know, there are two major religions, Zoro Zoroastrianism and Manichaeism. And Manichaeism was extremely strong all along since the third century until uh, even in France in the time of uh, the Qatar uh, uh, struggle, it, it invaded St. Augustine, for example, had to fight against, it invaded all North Africa and all uh, South of Europe. So these are very big trends linked to very big cultural forces which worked out the, what we call the social imaginaire of people which used many uh, themes which are religious and cultural in the same time. And many Shia movements, because in uh, the time of Umayyad period and the time of Abbasid period were opposed forces to the central political force. These opposing movements, had to use all the social forces which were not integrated in the political centralizing power of the caliphate, which means that they gave the opportunity to many ethnic groups to express their own traditions, their own identities, which were negated by the centralizing caliphate state. That's why we find so many movements, so many expressions which are religious, but I would not say necessarily Islamic in these uh, Shia movements. And as you know, we have two big branch which survived, the branch of Imami Shiaism and the branch of Ismaili Shiaism. But these branches actually have been divided in many other branches because, as I say, it's all the opposing movements of groups which didn't accept to be ruled by the central Islamic state with the, what we call the Islamic law. So here, you see, we have to look to that from a sociological point of view, from a historical point of view, a cultural point of view, because the cultures do not die. 
they leave always to the group, the groups, and they resist until Shiism itself will become a centralized political state in Iran with the Safavid, then uh, Shiism will become a religion, an official religion, like Sunnism has been an official religion. So who are and we have opposing forces, like the Babism, for example, like the Baha'is, which raised also in Iran. It's the same. It continues, although there is a, a, a centralized political force with an orthodoxy, a religious orthodoxy. By the way, orthodoxy goes always with a central political state force, always. Which means that orthodoxy, which is uh, uh, claimed today by some Muslim groups, is actually the product of a political will, a political control. It's not the product of the, a theological endeavor to put all the questions and to build an intellectual coherence between what is taught in the revealed text and what we have to say as theologians and philosophers about the linkage between the revealed text and our life. This is a different thing, different issue. <coughs> the uh, movements that, for example, Norman Korn uh, writes about in his book, The Pursuit of the Millennium, I'm sure you know. Yes, this yes, yes, yes. Is, is there a link there? Of course, yes, it's the same. It's, it's the, the same. same trend, yes, absolutely, <coughs> yes. It's the same trend. Not quite contemporary. It happens a little later. Yes, but it is recurrent. Yes. For example, in the Sudan, we had the yes. Mahdi. Yes. It's the yes. link to the, yes. this old yes. force yes. of messianism, yes. promised messi, yes. who promises the delivery yes. from all the suffering of right. people right. in this, uh, in this yes. earth. Yes. OK, now let's, we're, we'll do, uh, go to a, a few more rather concrete questions and then we will come back to the big issues. So, oh. medium, I think. You happy, Fred? Good. Um, one of the things that strikes the observer very strongly about Islam is that although there are few non-Islamic documents about the Prophet and his times, Muslims seem to know everything about the Prophet, his life, what he said, how he combed his beard, how he cut his hair, how he cut his nails. How, do, how does it happen that Muslims have such a, a detailed and accurate picture of their prophet? Yes, here again we can understand it if we uh, compare this phenomenon, which is a psychological, cultural one, to the phenomenon which happened in, the, in Christianity with Jesus. They developed also a memory of Christ to build a model, to imitate this model, so this is a general tendency in human mind and in human groups to build a model, to offer this model to the whole group so that the group has solid foundations to which the group sticks and according to which the group will produce its identity, as we call it now, its personality. And once this process has reached a level of development, it will work by itself. And it will increase in the invention, adding new features to the model, enriching the model through the individual experiences made of this model. For example, the Sufis, as we call them, in Christianity, in Judaism as well, in, in Muslims, have this tension, internal tension, to worship the model, to follow the model, to incarnate in themselves the model, 
so that people witness this model in somebody who become the new incarnation again and again of the model to go through a kind of sanctified history. That's why sanctity is the main force at work in this continuous relationship between the built model and the individual existence in which the model is recurrent and the collective existence of the group around these recurrent models incarnated in leaders who are called saints with the tombs, with the veneration in the tombs, etc. And it, 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 it gives you everything. But this, is, this is the issue. But are you, are you then suggesting that all of those volumes of hadith so carefully sorted out by people like Bukhari and so on are really just uh, human artifacts? Uh, uh, it's, uh, pay attention how you put it. If you say just like this, human artifacts, you have listeners for whom these texts are the authentic expression of the model according to which they behave and they think. So we have to find the word to respect this existing humanity which is built and produced according to this belief, which is a fact, a psychological fact, a historical fact, a political fact, a cultural fact. We cannot neglect it just by saying, okay, me, I am staying in my history. I know that you are, uh, you are not uh, aware of what has happened to you. Me, I know what has happened to you. You see how it works. This, what has been done through 19th century by Orientalists, when Orientalism studied this hadith and showed through philological methods that it's artifacts through centuries. It is a collective production, as I explained, of people living, living according to the model, as I explained, which is psychologically true. But again, you see, we have to put in the same explanation the reality of people taking these texts as authentic and which produce new beliefs and create new languages which are given to be perceived and to be used as authentic creations coming from the beginning from the founding time. Here, I, here we are in the mythical knowledge. But the mythical knowledge put today by a historian who refuses to divide, as we did in 19th century up to the last 50s, in all schools of history in Europe, which put aside and away those people who are uh, believing what they want, savage people, archaic people, traditional people, all this vocabulary, and we, we Europeans, reason of enlightenment, knowledge, controlled knowledge, mastered critical knowledge, etc. This is the point. And you see how we touch here, a deep point in the psychology of knowledge as it works in European themselves. This is not well known by Europeans today when they face Muslims or other people or all other underdeveloped third world countries. Because with this so-called modern vocabulary, we recover again. We go back again to the intellectual cleavages made so strong in the positivist knowledge in 19th century. It's the same, working and imposing itself 
and its so-called explanations to our perception of the present time. Is there a bridge to be built there? Can one? We are trying to bring the bi to, 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 to build this bridge. So what I'm saying here, it's, it's this endeavor to build the bridge. When I speak, I give lectures in Muslim countries, I speak like this. And I can tell you, Muslims are very happy because they find an explanation which does not exclude them from the so-called modern culture, from the so-called knowledge. They are included with other people. So they, okay, it works. They cannot say we are different from all these people who speak directly to God. No, they have not this arrogance. If you explain like this, you include these styles of culture inside the whole knowledge which we have to build with not only with history but with other disciplines especially anthropology that's why i mentioned it all the time then muslims are listening they're not angry they are angry when you exclude them you say to them oh your hadith is just an uh, artifact uh, they become, of course, angry. Like when you say to Europeans, excuse me, to, you say to Europeans, oh, your uh, uh, reason of enlightenment, it's just a, a local history. It's not universal as you present it. They become very angry, especially here in France. I don't know in England if they, if they do. But here, don't say this, because it's linked to the interpretation of French Revolution. And French Revolution is the new founding time, le temps fondateur, of a new mythology starting to give basis, fundamentals, to the new republican state against the monarchic state. You see how mythology can work in a modern society like France, which has participated to the production of modernity? So I heard Mrs. Thatcher, excuse me, uh, yeah. saying the same thing uh, in, uh, in uh, La Haye uh, la last mm -hmm. May. We had yeah. a, a meeting there where she was present and she presented, uh, she presented the uh, British democracy as the most wonderful democracy, uh, unimitated democracy produced in the world. So this is also a kind of presenting something which started in the modern time, and which started just like the Quran started, just like Jesus started. Le temps fondateur, yes. the founding time, yes. which is the mythical time. Yes. Yes. The dream time, as the Australians would say. Yes, dream time, but uh, which has psychological reality. It's not the only a dream. Uh, no, the dream is in here. I mean, yes. it's very human. Uh, and yes. it is applied yes. Yes. in the existence. Well. But given this difference in, uh, in, um, in approach to the world, is this somehow at the core of the difficulty in which people who inhabit uh, mythological time have when coming, for example, as minorities into countries like France or Britain, which have uh, derived their way of looking at the world from the 18th century enlightenment. Is this what the, the central clash is? Yes, it's uh, surely in this uh, what I'm explaining, but uh, as uh, far as these minorities are concerned, uh, I, there are also new factors coming into play. Because these are people first who belong to uh, uh, how can I put it, uh, very simple people, they are workers, as we call them, who came here just to offer their labor force. They do not belong to uh, uh, high-level uh, social classes, and uh, except, of course, some intellectuals who came after, but the major uh, part of these minorities are workers. They came here to find their, uh, to the, their life, their, their existence. So this is a point. And these people, of course, came from low-level 
culture and society in their own societies. This creates a gap, a larger gap between themselves and the surrounding, the new society, which is a European society. So you add to all what I have explained on the level of cultures, this new fact, which is important. And you know how people here regard to these workers, Ausarbeiter, like they are called in, in, uh, in Germany, and here les travailleurs nord-africains in France. So this is all the whole social phenomena and interrelation uh, between the Europeans who discover this population for them without culture, who have beliefs ununderstandable, who are not yet not uh, well educated in the language, etc., etc., and this creates all the differences and uh, all the wrong perceptions and interpretations which, uh, in which we are engaged since the last uh, 60s, because it's also a very recent phenomenon. The, the, the number of, of, of these workers started to increase in the 60s because Europe, as you know, in the time, uh, wanted, needed a labor force from outside because people here were not enough to face all the demand of the uh, increasing industry. And this has generated all these uh, forces. And uh, up to now, unfortunately, we didn't find in European societies uh, responses to, that, to these difficulties. But here also we have to mention the differences of uh, the, uh, the answers given in each European society. For example, this year I discovered in Holland uh, the very specific, special answer of Holland to that question. Holland is, uh, has a, a democratic experience which is extremely different from the one we know here in France the one we know in England, very different. And they give really uh, very original answers to these new problems. So this is a problem for me which will be raised in the new Europe, which is being uh, uh, built and which come to exist, I hope, uh, in, the, in next year. And the European countries will uh, exchange their own experiences about this, and I hope we'll find uh, other answers which will be more relevant to the questions raised by these minorities in Europe, but also the questions raised by European culture as it still works inside European minds itself, as I mentioned, Positivism, for example, is still at work in the mind of people. And you cannot approach these cultures, foreign cultures, with a positivist uh, knowledge and a positivist uh, uh, inter uh, rules uh, of interpretation. Can you explain precisely what you mean by positivist? Positivist is what I mentioned, that all knowledge has to be controlled by a chronological, factual history. If you say to me, for example, Abraham came to Mecca in the time uh, before, the, I, I have to produce a document, a chronology, to control how he came, etc. Otherwise, I would tell, this is just a legend. You can repeat it if you want, but it has no historical evidence. No geographical evidence. You see, this is positivism. And uh, you can say this about the prophet. It has been said about the, the prophet. Or about Jesus. All the lives of Jesus which have been written according to this positivist uh, uh, reading of the text. They say, miracles. It's just an invention of people. The imaginary of people. As I explained for, for uh, the Messi, etc. So this is positivism, uh, and uh, now historians, as I said, are trying to get rid from this 
intellectual approach and to include cultures according to their own expressions. You mentioned um, immigrant workers, Gast Arbeiter or um, um, similar, but they come from many different ethnic backgrounds, not all of them Muslim. Do Muslim uh, minorities have a particular difficulty in integrating in Western societies more than other minorities, or, or is it more or less the same? Yes, the difficulty comes more from the national ideological control of the government to whom these minorities belong, more than to what we call Islamic again. You see, it is very clear here in France. We have Algerians, we have Moroccans, we have Tunisians, we have Senegalese, etc., Turks, Pakistanis in France. Each community is linked to its own government and controlled by the government, by either religious people or by uh, political people, for example, we have uh, Amical des Algériens en France, which is the emanation of the, of the Algerian government to control the Algerians living here. So it is the, 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 the origin of these differences or difficulties are more political than religious. But again, it's given to perceive, to be perceived as religious, and we cover the real reason, which is political. Take a concrete example of the Rushdie affair in Britain. Yes. How do you see the various roles of politics and religion in that particular affair? Oh, this is very complicated. Very complicated. It would take time to, to analyze this, yes. It's extremely complicated and it is very, very revealing precisely of many of the problems we have already mentioned. Uh, for example, we have uh, uh, a migrant coming from India and Pakistan who is educated in English culture, who is a novelist, uh, and who is writing as any, uh, any writer in, in England or, 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 or France or uh, anywhere. But which are the literary traditions in Indian literature? in Egyptian literature, in Iranian literature, take any one of the Muslim uh, countries, compared to the literary tradition developed in Europe since 18th century. Here is an issue. How can people receive a novel dealing on this subject when you do not have a literary tradition which prepares people to receive such a novel? Here, all people are prepared, it's okay. And they are also indifferent to the subject. He can tell what he wants about the prophet. The prophet is not this model. This model constructed through centuries, as I explained. And suddenly you touch and you break this model constructed through centuries. And you break it with which tools? In which intellectual artistic framework? The clashes. It, on all levels, clashes on all levels. Okay, these clashes are the product of our present history. We are always meeting each other, clashing with each other, fighting with each other. But which kind of thinking do we use on both sides to face these challenges? to go through these clashes instead of using a knowledge adapted to this new mixture of our traditions, etc., what do we do? You remember how the medias have reacted? We are like this, how can we sue? We cannot accept this. And on the other, crazy. All people became crazy, and all have lost the control on the matter, because the matter was too much complicated. 
too much involving so many symbols, so many myths, so many traditions which no one can handle with our so-called culture as it works. The reason of enlightenment cannot, definitely cannot handle such a moment of history of clashing cultures. When I said here in France, in the newspaper Le Monde, this, this, this what I'm saying now, I have been attacked from all my colleagues. They could not understand it, especially in the time of the, of the fighting. So this is very interesting and complicated. And of course, uh, we, should, we should come back and back to it all the time. Thank you, sir.